Hi, I'm Dr. Wilson. I'm a PhD molecular biologist and welcome to another COVID debunking video. You know, this trend of getting up, speaking at public hearings and saying wrong stuff about COVID is really getting out of hand. I've covered one of these things the past two weeks and now I'm having to cover another one. This time it's Dr. Christina Parks who decided to talk at a public hearing for a Michigan House bill concerning COVID vaccine requirements. Like most people who speak pseudoscience about COVID and vaccine-related topics, there are grains of truth to what she says, but her conclusions and messages are all wrong. And sometimes what she says is also just downright wrong. So let's get into it. What I want to address today in this limited time is the fact that vaccine requirements and mandates are based on the faulty assumption that the vaccines in question prevent transmission of the pathogen. Right, and COVID vaccines happen to reduce transmission of SARS-CoV-2 by a lot. Does do the vaccines for COVID prevent transmission? No. In fact, they were never designed to do that. <sighs> Look, in original clinical trials of COVID vaccines, they did not specifically test for whether or not these COVID vaccines could prevent transmission. That's because the clinical trials were not powered enough to do that. But since then, there have been plenty of studies to address that question. I've talked about some of them before here on this channel, but just recently there was a massive study conducted in the Netherlands. This study involved a huge number of people and tracked a huge number of contacts. And they ultimately found that COVID vaccines reduce COVID transmission in households by 71%. Now, the authors make it clear that the Alpha variant was the dominant variant circulating in the Netherlands at the time. Now, with the Delta variant, we don't have as much robust data, but we do have a good amount of data. And so far, that data is showing us a consistent picture, that COVID vaccines reduce transmission of COVID. There is absolutely no reason to believe that all of that reduction would be abolished by the Delta variant, and the available data suggests that it absolutely is not abolished. So if COVID vaccines reduce transmission of COVID, which they do, this is absolutely a relevant public health measure that everybody should take. All right, so you're asking, what about this 95% effectiveness? If you look at those clinical trials, they do not say that they prevent transmission. They expressly say that they're measuring whether they um, attenuate symptoms. Not quite. So the clinical trials, when it comes to efficacy, were testing two things. Do vaccinated individuals get COVID less often than unvaccinated? And when they get it, do they suffer less severe disease than unvaccinated people? In the clinical trials, the answers to both of these questions was yes. By saying that it attenuates symptoms, she is purposely downplaying the power of vaccines here, which is to prevent disease. And that's the whole point, right? If very few people ever got severe disease from COVID, then we wouldn't have to worry about it. So they're 95% effective based on their clinical trials at attenuating symptoms for the first variant, which is essentially gone in our population. Not just the original variant. Scientists have been studying the effectiveness of vaccines against variants of concern for a very long time. And the COVID vaccines remain highly effective at preventing severe disease, even with the Delta variant. Um, CDC Director Walensky basic, basically said that these vaccines have no ability to prevent infection by and transmission of the Delta variant. That's not true. She said that it's concerning and that vaccinated people have similar viral loads to unvaccinated people, which is an inaccurate statement. Let me explain. So when people are referring to viral load, you have to make sure they're actually referring to what viral load means, which is the amount of infectious virus in a sample. When people talk about viral load and they're only talking about PCR or the CT value of a sample, that's not viral load. That's viral genome copy number. That's not the same thing. So far, no one has done experiments testing the actual amount of infectious virus that is shed by a vaccinated person versus an unvaccinated person in the context of the Delta variant. So we can't make any real definitive statements on viral load when it comes to Delta variant and vaccinated versus unvaccinated. But like I said before, the data that we do have highly suggests that COVID vaccines still reduce the transmission of Delta variant. And those data remain true no matter what the CDC director might say. 
the, I mean, do the vaccines prevent the virus from infecting and uh, replicating in the nose and nasopharynx? No. They've only been shown to prevent that replication in the lungs. They're different. The mucosa is very different than the lungs. It's very different than the blood. You inject it to the blood. You make antibodies in your blood. The virus isn't infecting your blood. It's infecting your mucosa, and you don't produce any IgA to neutralize it. Okay, look. IgA antibodies are the kinds of antibodies that appear in your mucosas, so in your nose and throat, for example. Researchers have even measured the amounts of IgG and IgA antibodies that follow COVID vaccination, and they are definitely there. So I don't know where she's getting this idea, but it's wrong. In fact, recent studies have shown that the vaccinated, especially with the Delta variant, and the unvaccinated have similar amounts of virus in their nose and throat similar amounts of viral genome copy number at a particular time point. That's the correct thing to say there. And mind you that even with the Delta variant, that viral genome copy number decreases much faster in vaccinated individuals versus unvaccinated individuals. That means that the vaccine has done its job. It's trained the immune system to clear the virus out much faster than it would be able to otherwise. In Barnstable, Massachusetts, the CDC tracked an outbreak of 469 cases of COVID. 74% occurred in fully vaccinated, and four out of five of those hospitalized were vaccinated. Yes, that's because it was a gathering of mostly vaccinated people. So you would expect most of the cases to be in fully vaccinated people. And what she doesn't say is that none of those vaccinated people who got sick with COVID ended up dying. Not a single one. Vaccines doing its job. So let's look at DTaP, which the scientists and the CDC have known since 2014 that the acellular pertussis vaccine does not prevent people from getting infected with the pertussis bacteria and passing it to others. So this is where she starts to go full anti-vaccine. This topic has nothing to do with COVID vaccines, but she's bringing it up in an attempt to undermine vaccines generally. And her point is, of course, wrong. It's true that the acellular pertussis vaccine doesn't necessarily prevent transmission of pertussis. It's true that the acellular pertussis vaccine, which is what is widely used in America right now, doesn't necessarily prevent transmission of pertussis. It prevents disease. Remember, that's what vaccines are meant to do first and foremost, prevent disease. But here's what's supposed to happen in order to prevent everybody from getting sick from pertussis. Starting at two months, children are vaccinated against pertussis. In those first two months of life, that baby is vulnerable to pertussis. That's why the mother during pregnancy is supposed to get a booster shot against pertussis so that she can produce antibodies that she will then pass on to her baby to offer it that very critical protection in the early two months of life before they themselves get vaccinated. But anti-vaxxers don't like boosters. So what happens is they don't get vaccinated, they don't pass immunity on to their baby, and their baby is vulnerable during those two months, they get pertussis, they get sick, they possibly die. Vaccines are scheduled the way they are for a reason, and this woman is trying to undermine all of that information and all of that public health just in order to make a wrong point about COVID vaccines. Embarrassing. All right, what about the flu vaccine? Well, they have shown that basically it, there's no difference, there's no statistical difference if you're vaccinated or unvaccinated, whether you get the flu or not. That is absolutely not true. Flu vaccines are definitely effective in preventing the flu. This has been studied in multiple countries in multiple years, and it remains consistent. Even though flu vaccines are not equally effective at preventing the flu from year to year, they always have some effectiveness and that effectiveness matters on a population level. Vaccines are made to a specific variant, and when that variant mutates, the vaccine no longer recognizes it. And so it's like you're seeing a completely new virus. Okay, so she's talking about COVID again, and she's wrong. When your immune system sees the spike protein that is given to you in these COVID vaccines, it does not just make one antibody against one part of the spike protein it has what we call a polyclonal response. If you've heard of monoclonal antibody, that is one kind of antibody that binds one part of a protein. But poly means many, of course. That means there are many different antibodies that bind many different parts of the protein. The implication here is, of course, that 
if a virus was going to mutate to completely avoid the immune system, it would have to mutate at all of the sites that all of those antibodies recognize. Something like that is going to be gradual. It will require a lot of time and evolution on part of the virus. And what does the virus need for all that evolution to happen? It needs a lot of people to infect. And what do we know COVID vaccines do? It reduces the spread of COVID. That's exactly what we need to do in order to fight these variants. Vaccination. In fact, this week, a paper came out, and what it showed is that with this Delta variant, when you're vaccinated, your body makes antibodies that are supposed to neutralize the virus. But they were supposed to neutralize the old variant. When they see this new variant, what they're doing is they're actually, the antibodies are taking the virus and helping it infect the cells. Of course, she doesn't cite the paper, which is rude, but I'm pretty sure she's talking about this paper. And if you actually read it, you'll see that these authors found that these antibodies can enhance disease in a cell culture system. That's what in vitro means. It means in a dish. But that they can't enhance disease in vivo, in an actual organism. That's because there are lots of ways for antibodies to neutralize. It doesn't have to just bind and neutralize the protein. It can bind the target protein and then interact with T cells or other cells in the immune system in order to neutralize that protein. So I feel like I'm covering this every week, but again, no, there is still no evidence that antibody dependent enhancement is happening with COVID vaccines. 70% of African Americans have not taken this vaccine. Why? because they don't trust their government. Do they have reason not to trust their government? Well, between the um, years of 1930 and 1970, the CDC conducted the Tuskegee experiment. <sighs> this is a topic for me that I understand, but it's also really frustrating. Yes, the Tuskegee experiments were a horrible example of how racism can drive people to do terrible things and then lie about it. But what am I as a black American supposed to do in response to the message that Dr. Parks is sending here. Am I supposed to just refuse any new groundbreaking medical treatment that the data show are highly effective? No, that is completely backwards. You cannot use that moment in history to make blanket statements about anything and everything that comes up in the present. You have to actually learn from history, learn what the signs of those things are, learn how to look at the data yourself, learn how to recognize when something like that might be happening. And if you look at what's happening now, and who is the most vaccinated, it's the richest and whitest people in the world. So I don't think this is another Tuskegee experiment. So stop using it to scare people. Well, in 2012, whistleblower William Thompson came forward and said, we published a study that said MMR does not cause autism, but we lied. In fact, we shredded data that showed that when black boys are vaccinated on time, they have increased rates of autism diagnosis. And we shredded it and we left it out of the paper. And the full anti-vaccine-ness of Dr. Parks peaks here. She thinks that vaccines cause autism in black boys. This is entirely untrue, and I talked about this very topic when I debunked Riza Islam in my Disinformation Dozen series. That whistleblower she's talking about who had supposedly shredded data, well, that data surfaced and was looked at, analyzed, and reviewed by statisticians and scientists. And you know what they found? They found that there is no association between vaccines and autism in black boys. Furthermore, separate independent studies that should have picked up such a link failed to do so because vaccines don't cause autism ever. This statement right here completely destroys Dr. Parks' credibility in my opinion. It is completely unforgivable in 2021 to go in front of elected representatives and claim that vaccines cause autism. So shame on you, Dr. Parks, for trying to regress the progress that public health has made by spreading ideas that are solely based on fear and ignorance. Well, that's going to do it for this week's video. If you can't tell, I get really upset when anti-vaxxers bring autism into the argument. It's just really disgusting. Speaking of which, this seems like a really good opportunity for me to do another Autistic Self-Advocacy Network fundraiser. Autistic people are consistently victimized by people in the anti-vaccine movement. They always try to reduce 
autistic people to just having something that nobody wants or needs to be cured. And it's just disgusting. So since this is just my hobby, I like to sometimes donate the YouTube ad revenue that I make from these videos to the Autistic Self Advocacy Network, which is a nonprofit autism advocacy organization run by autistic people for autistic people. They do great work, so if you want to read more about them and donate, I'll put a link in the description for you to check out. In addition, I'll put a link to all of the science that I talk about in this video in the description so that you can read that for yourself. Again, please feel free to donate, and I'll be donating all the ad revenue that I make from this video to the Autistic Self Advocacy Network. As always, thank you for watching, and if you enjoyed this, don't forget to subscribe so you can catch me next week where I'll be debunking some more funky stuff. See you then.